morning, Big Glenn. Good morning. Pleasure to have you on. How are you? Uh, it's a very beautiful day here in Sofia, Bulgaria. Thank you for having me. Good. It's an absolute pleasure to have you on. Thank you, my friend. For those who are new to the podcast, Leadership Unplugged, a general overview, if you like, we try to be as raw and unfiltered as we possibly can and allow our conversations to flow in whichever direction they might want to go in. We may have a couple of ideas of, of what we want to talk about, which you and I have discussed uh, pre this conversation, McGlenn. <clears throat> but generally, we just want to talk about interesting things within the tech world and how that might help people who are either looking to move towards leadership or are in leadership or interested in moving their careers forward, right? So today we've got yourself, McGlenn, VP of InfoSec at Payhawk, one of the most successful fintech companies in the, in the world, I think, which have, which have done incredibly well. We might dive into some of that in a bit more detail and, and, and unearth what you believe are some of the bits of wisdom within that company and, and how you've been successful and, and your remit within that, but also a little bit about what cybersecurity means and what infosecurity means and what that community looks like and how, how people are affected within that and what we think might be important to think about as we move forward. If anybody's interested, please check out the other episodes, Spotify, Apple, you can check the landing page, all of our contact details, McGlenn, mine, LinkedIn, email, however you want to reach us. We'd love to keep the conversation going. So if you've enjoyed, please drop in and, and and engage with us in the conversation. Enough about that, McGlenn. Let's start as we do with the majority of our guests. And could we just get a bit of an understanding of, of you and your background and sort of what you do now and, and how you've ended up there? Sure. Um, so I started in the sector, in the information security technical sector, since my teenagehood, basically, I was I started as a web developer. This is what I really enjoyed at the time. And then I slowly progressed into a sysadmin, DevOps engineer. And then I ended up working basically my passion, which was always information security. Just a long time ago, that there wasn't really that many job opportunities in the sector, and especially at the level and capacity that we have today, like the CISO role and everything around it. Mm. And I'm super excited that, that all that have changed dr dr dramatically throughout the years. And now today we have such an amazing palette of uh, various career like, paths and opportunities that you can choose from. And I naturally grown up in, into that position. Uh, obviously, I spent a lot of time in, in various technical roles. But today I'm a more into, I wouldn't say you know, traditional people management, but I work with people most of the time then with technology. Obviously, my technical experience helps a lot, but uh, that's the reality that we're living today. Yeah. And throughout that, the years, apologies. No, I was just thinking, and um, I, I try not to make a habit of interrupting, but you said something interesting there at the start about you you had a passion for, for info security. Yeah. That's... Is that unusual? I, I'm trying not to judge, right? I, I can't imagine being a kid thinking, oh, you know what? I, I really like no. cybersecurity, you know? It's not unusual. I think uh, it's just, you know, uh, I had a lot of curiosity in me. And mm -hmm. when I was young, there was these uh, online communities. I, they're, they're still out there today in various shapes and forms. But at the time, the internet was a little bit of a wild place. So you could do a lot of things online and uh, it was also quite more vulnerable. I don't know if then if I can compare them today or not, but it was like easier to access things and do things. And it was an unregulated, unchartered territory. It was like very, very interesting to roam around and do interesting things. So we had this online community where we would be in uh, a so-called script kiddies or just a, a, a young folks with like a lot of curiosity to break things. Luckily, we didn't get into any trouble. But at the time, we couldn't harvest this energy and this curiosity into a proper career because there wasn't interesting jobs in that particular vector and sector to, to work on. Luckily, today, that's a completely different picture. And also today, you have such an amazing communities and events and things like Capture the Flags and, and other opportunities that 
if you have like a critical mass or a, a group of people that are very curious in the in the technological sector and they would like to break things, they could do it safely, responsibly, and they could uh, get something very positive out of it, which is a very productive and successful career. Okay, that's that's amazing. Why why do you think? Because it was a bit like the Wild West, wasn't it, when the internet first came out? <clears throat> Nobody really knew what it was going to be and what it would evolve into. And, and how much data it would harvest and all of the vulnerabilities, et cetera. So as we as we fast forward now into into today's world, what what's changed in that you're now able to get careers within this space when when all, all those vulnerabilities existed back then? Was it perhaps that people just ignored it and that people are now thinking about it more? I would say at the time there wasn't that many financial incentives. So if we look at it from a threat actor perspective, at the time, we're speaking 15 plus years ago, crypto wasn't as it is today. And you didn't have that much ability to, like from a threat actor perspective, to exploit businesses. So maybe that's why this kind of a black market didn't evolve that much. There was a lot of, uh, a lot of things happening, like a lot of spam and other types of fraud. But it wasn't that the cyber crime scene wasn't that big as of today. Like obviously today, these threat actors they can make millions out of uh, dark activities, and they have a very serious financial incentive to do so. But at the time, it was a bit more difficult for them to extract anything out of businesses, and and also right. it was unregulated. There wasn't GDPR. There wasn't anything around it, so businesses didn't really care about it that much. Um, and there wasn't that many career opportunities. Obviously, there was ISO at the time when we were doing uh, and we were young, but it was mostly in InfoSec, there was most of these kind of jobs around maybe some uh, assurance and auditing opportunities, but not that many of uh, modern professions like pen testing and red teaming and lots of other high level leadership positions that we have today which is which is amazing where we came up to today because today i think organizations especially those that invest in cybersecurity they're way more healthier and safer to to work with absolutely do, do you think then because from an observer's perspective like i'm i'm not deep into infrastructure and, and cybersecurity worlds although i'm i'm involved in in tech generally right there's there's some organizations that i speak to who who don't really prioritize it it still it still feels like it's slightly behind the curve in we need we really need to sort that out and put preventative measures in place so that a, a breach doesn't happen or is it a well i'll i'll get to that when i get to it i think if, if something bad happens I'll, I'll deal with it then or do you think companies are being proactive with it it, it really depends uh in which sector they're operating, what kind of data they're hosting, and like what is their uh, basically uh, risk acceptance? Like what kind of risk they 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 are they are comfortable to accept? And obviously, the, these companies that, that you're citing, maybe they don't feel threatened, maybe they don't uh, collect and and preserve a lot of sensitive and important assets, digital assets, mm. or maybe they don't value that. I don't know what's the reason, or maybe they haven't experienced a serious cybersecurity breach because from history, we can see that many companies have bankrupted because they have neglected neglected their cybersecurity uh, program and posture. So it might be that like, they haven't had experienced that kind of an accident before. For example, last year, unfortunately, I had a motorcycle accident. And now I, I look into, into this activity a little bit more, uh, with more caution and, and I got more careful. I didn't yeah. have a protective jacket at the time, which was my mistake. It could have saved me a lot of trouble and a lot of uh, uh, problems. So nowadays I, I, I look differently on that. Maybe after you experience an, an accident and, and it causes a serious damage, it could be reputation or financial damage to your business, then you may reconsider your uh, your your approach and, and the way you do cybersecurity within your organization. But I think that's the expensive route because mm -hmm. even like if even if you do the minimum uh, groundwork and, and you spend some time thinking about it and 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 introduce some protective element to your organization, 
maybe you could save save in the long run yourself quite a lot of trouble. Do Do you think that will change over time as we become? I mean, as the world becomes more and more tech oriented, as we hold more and more data, as it's more and more likely to be breached, and there's more and more access points, like it just grows and grows and grows. At at the moment, it feels like there are still some organizations which I might do something if I ever feel the pain of it. But until then, I won't do anything. Motorbike accident is a is a perfect analogy for that. But but do you think that might change moving forward? In that it'll be that you have to because I know there's certain regulations like within fintech, example, and finance where you have to have certain measures in place, don't you? I I think it's not only that. Uh, I think the businesses will evolve in that perspective because. When you're when you're looking for another partner or a vendor or someone to work with or someone to invest with, you're always looking into their cybersecurity posture because it's a it's a health indicator of the how well this organization is doing. Right. And if you as a business don't look into that, maybe some organizations will reconsider investing or working with you every time. For example, when we are about to work with any vendor. We have to do a, a, a thorough um, due diligence and really understand their security posture. And this is a very, very strong decision factor in our overall procurement process, and I believe to many other businesses. And I don't think, obviously, regulation is something really, really important, and it helped the overall environment to be safer and secure. But just the businesses will... Uh, eventually kick out those that are don't consider their cybersecurity program and posture as important. It's not just a checkbox security so that you can obtain certain certification and, uh, and, and basically audit and confirm where you are in your cybersecurity journey. It's when it comes to business, uh, other companies and other people in my position will and would like to audit and can confirm those security controls. So you don't you don't only have to like cover up things and ensure them um, on the high level; they have to be properly implemented. Otherwise, you are basically losing up uh, potential investments and customers. Yeah, that that makes a lot of sense. You alluded earlier to sort of the people environment within this space and and some of the communities that exist. <clears throat> how how does how does that look at the moment? Do you, do you think people still don't really understand it? They don't understand what info security needs to look like or cyber security needs to look like. And and therefore you've got cowboys out there, to go back to the Wild West analogy, um, that, that take advantage of that. And or that, that there's a community out there that are trying to be more transparent with it and, and let others know about it and help each other out. Uh, that's a very interesting question. Uh, so for, first of all, someone who literally grew up in the online cybersecurity communities throughout the years, there is a significant change in the overall like feeling of the various communities. Okay. Uh, obviously, I started a little bit on the gray scale, even dark scale. And even as of today, I spend a little bit of time in darknet to understand what are the trends and what's happening. And obviously, I spend a lot of time in, in more high-level leadership type of uh, communities like Club CISO and similar. And what I can see in, in this whole spectrum is the more hands-on, technical, even dark black hat communities, people are way more transparent and, and honest and direct than in the high-level leadership space. And I really hope that's going to change in the leadership space as well, because there is a lot of insight to be shared. Mm. But Nowadays, there is a lot of hype in the infosec industry, and the hype is possibly given by the fact that there is a, a lot of business to be uh, made in, in that space because of regulations, because of a lot of things that could be done in that space. And I don't know how positive that is to the community because the community doesn't really want to share much uh, for some reason. I, I don't I don't see, as, as I said, these like high-level leadership communities, even in LinkedIn or elsewhere, they don't share as much as, as they, they should, I think. And then there is this hype about new products and services and things that, especially on conferences, that I don't think it's helping that much the community itself. Obviously, it's great for the business, for, for them. Uh, but overall, 
there is a lot of work to be done, especially on the, on the leadership level, because I think the more seasoned CISOs and, and, and people in a leadership security role, they have a lot of insight and a lot of experience that could be shared. Maybe they don't, they don't want to share it because of like trade secrets or, or other reasons, but I think they don't realize how important their knowledge and, and their insight would be to the to the overall community and the overall enhancement and improvement on the on, in the space. I think that's a really interesting point. I think I think we've discussed this separately off, off air where I think we used a, a, me- a mechanic as an example, didn't we? Like a car mechanic. And yeah. if you know nothing about cars, then a car mechanic can say, well, that's a thousand euros or a thousand pounds to get that done. And you go, yeah. well, okay, because I, I, I don't know anything about it. And again, from an outside perspective, it very much feels like that's what the space that you're in might look like it's it's quite intimidating from the outside looking in um do, do you think that's valid do you think it is a particularly complicated technical space i i don't think so honestly uh from a technical perspective it's not that complicated if you know the basics the fundamentals uh you could basically understand that most of the today's technologies under underneath the the hood, the technology is not not that complicated. It could be well understood by an engineer, and a lot of times, a lot of products and services, they have a little bit uh, an edge or something that they 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 kind of wrap it in a great sales pitch. Mm-hmm. And under the hood, it's not you know that uh, groundbreaking thing that you could not find elsewhere. Maybe they're solving the problem in a more creative way or they're saving you time and effort, which is very important to, in today's world. But at the end of the day, technology is not that complicated. And the good things about security is, especially if someone who have been a, a, in, in a DevOps world before is, DevOps, for example, could be a bit complicated because it is a, like basically you're on the, on the edge of the technological development in DevOps. Like things are constantly evolving in the cloud and container and other worlds and serverless. While in InfoSec, the fundamentals, they stay the same. You just change the medium. So if you understand very well in depth the fundamentals, that's super crucial for you to evolve in your career, no matter the technological medium that you're right now in this moment. It could be cloud, could be mainframe, could be anything. And and I, I think for people who'd like to start and progress their career in the InfoSec world, and they're a little bit afraid of technology, I think they really need to spend uh, quite a good amount of time to understand the fundamentals of technology, uh, of computer systems, obviously, and to really, um, really understand why would a threat actor compromise a certain system? And, And if they're able to understand this simple concept, for various systems that could be, as I said, virtual machines, physical machines, containers, whatever, they could then migrate these concepts to any other systems and mediums, and that would really help them to protect them. Because if you don't really understand that, how are you going to protect whatever? Like It, it doesn't really matter in mm-hmm. what kind of environment you're, you're going to be located, but if you don't understand the A and B of, of uh, computer systems and, and that, how, how are you going to move across more complex uh, abstractions and virtualizations? But that doesn't have to intimidate you, the complexity of technology. The only thing that has to be super important for you is to think about what are the attack vectors? What are the ways that uh, a threat actors would compromise your systems? And what is their motivation? Obviously, there are many reasons, but you have to, as a professional, understand them. Once you do that, the technology is not that intimidating. I think that that that'd be music to the ears of many people. I feel so. If if we had listeners right now who were, I don't know, involved in a a growing tech company, and and it's it's at that point where it's it's growing into an unwieldy beast and it's growing arms and legs and starting to rapidly scale and holding more data, and it it might be at that point. We could argue that it should be sooner, but it might be at that point that they think, right, we really need to get this sorted. We really need to think about what this looks like and what our security environment looks like. What would be your, 
if you could only give so I, I i hate these lines sometimes but if you could only give like three tips just just do this ensure mm-hmm. that you at least do this and this will cover the the Pareto efficiencies right like the 20 percent of what you do covers 80 percent of the of the problem yeah. the Pareto principle yes um if you could only say just do this 20 percent, and you'd cover 80 percent of your yeah whatever it might be what what do you think that would be what would you say if you if you have to focus on the Pareto principle in in our sector probably would be the people because the people are the most vital for one organization and if we look at it from a perspective what is the weakest link in one organization rarely it could be technology only if especially in a freshly started startup rarely it could be technology because the technology nowadays comes with a pre-built controls of course you can weaken it by design but Generally speaking, the modern frameworks, the modern systems, and even clouds, they have a uh, integrated security controls to prevent most common mistakes and weaknesses. But if we look at it from the other perspective, it's definitely the people and the culture. Um, as, I, as I mentioned earlier, when we spoke, I really enjoyed the episode four with uh, David. Yeah. And you spoke about that. It. It's all about the people. In InfoSec, it's mostly about the people. In, in the last year and in generally in the last few years, if we look at the major reason for breaches, it's mostly social engineering related ones. So it could be phishing, recently on the rise is business email compromise and other similar types of threats, even insider threats. This is not something to be neglected. And if we, if, if we look at it from that perspective, from statistical empirical uh, perspective, Obviously, people are the most single most important thing for for you to look at as a as an infosec professional, and you you can do so many great things with with that. Uh, you need to start with fostering a great uh, infosec and cybersecurity culture. That's your main primary goal. That's as a as a security leader. That's my primary goal. I would like everyone in the company to be well aware about the potential threats. How do they happen? Because we may think that we are in control in in the technology that we use. Let's say as as an organization that grows quite significantly, they're using so many uh, various SaaS and other applications. It's just super Mm. difficult for you as an IT security professional to get your, uh, your basically monitoring around all of them. It's nearly impossible. There is shadow IT, there is a lot of things happening uh, at the same time at every various uh, team and and people are coming with their own devices. There's so many moving parts. And one thing that stays the same is the people. And if they have a very, very good understanding about what is the important things about your organization, like where is the important data, what they should and shouldn't do, and and how they and what they could do to protect it, to notify you and the team about various threats. This is something very very critical. Um, I used to work in in Amazon Web Services for a few years in Ireland, and I worked there as a security engineer. I spent a lot of time with uh, various teams and people, and I remember when I was speaking to some uh, security leaders at the time from the security uh, incident response team in AWS. And we were talking about like various indicators and and, and monitors they're applying and using. Obviously, they're quite ahead of of the time. Um, And I asked them a single question, like, what is your most important like uh, source of alerts and, and like indicators of compromise and things like that? And they were like, people, like, you have all these amazing, uh, super smart sensors everywhere that even if you have the latest and greatest technology, it might not be able to detect that. And if you train your people well, if you spend enough time, and I'm not saying to be super um, uh, focused on that, just a little bit of time during their onboarding to understand what is, what is important, what are the most uh, recent trends and threats in a way that you could really reach to them uh, so you, you could adapt that to the various teams. It could be a more techie with the uh, engineering teams. It could be uh, more aligned with, like I said, say sales teams and marketing teams because they are also uh, a, a form of, how to say, like an, an input, an endpoint. And they communicate with like leads and people in the, in the open internet. 
And they could be approached in so many ways through fake LinkedIn profiles or through their personal email where you, where you don't have zero control. Like there's no way for you to identify these kind of uh, threats and, and problems. So if you haven't spent the time to train your people and uh, bring their awareness to the level that they won't be anymore the weakest link in the organization, then most of the job is done, then you can safely focus on the technology and uh, obviously governance and all other very important, but I wouldn't say less important, but people are the, the core of your InfoSec program from my perspective. So if we, if we, we stayed on that point then around, around people, and I can only speak from my own experience and what others might say at, within this within this arena where I, I used to work for some big financial organizations that I, that I want to name. And you had to go through what was effectively a, it's like a questionnaire, yeah. like a security type questionnaire. And it was, it was all different types of security things that you had to do to get like a certificate in uh, air quotation marks at the end of it. And I very clearly remember just clicking my way through and going yeah 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 so all all fine like i'm not gonna leave my computer screen unlocked or i'm never gonna open a bad email etc and almost alluding to what we were talking about earlier about it being a tip box exercise you're if you yourself are very passionate and inquisitive and you've ended up in that space because you really enjoy that space Mm -hmm. Other people might see the security space as dry and boring and overly technical because that's what it might look like from an outside perspective. But then if if people are the biggest challenge within it, how do you get those people to view security in a different way where it's not just, can you just make sure you lock your computer before you go to the toilet, for example? You know, like how do, how do you... I don't know, make it exciting as a, as, a, as a leader? Like, how do you get people incentivized to want to behave correctly? I have a couple of uh, stories around that. So first thing is, what you have experienced, unfortunately, is a, I call it checkbox security. So a lot of organizations have this uh, security training programs that are very, very dry. When you start onboarding process, you spend the first few days, maybe in a lot of like corporate trainings and stuff. I don't yeah. think they work because uh basically it's a, it's it's a you go through them maybe even someone have shared with you the answers to them so you can like quickly skip and pass them and they don't leave anything to you for you to remember that uh once you continue working for the organization how to how to do things securely i don't think that works at all at this kind of trainings and the way and the way and the reason they are done is mostly through to compliance uh, organizations want to ensure that they have taught you about the secure ways to do your job, and then you continue on. own. This is sufficient for that perspective, but it's not sufficient to bring in and build security awareness. It's just not working. There are a couple of ways to do that in a more exciting way. Uh, the first one is obviously to continue simulations. And the, the thing that, that I find effective is to run phishing campaigns, but not only limited to your email. So you can run it in social and social websites, you can run it in like WhatsApp or whatever, because threat actors are actually doing that already. So it's better for you to be the first one to reach out to your employees and surprise them with, with something through social media or elsewhere, as instead of them clicking to something from a threat actor. And you have spent a good enough time in the beginning to explain uh, to the new starters through the onboarding process, how to report that, you're going to have a very successful rate of uh, detections through the people and actually uh, an actual detection, like of, of actual uh, attempts from threat actors. And it's going to be like a little game for, for you and them. And of course, as a leader, I personally prefer to award people with whatever I can and whatever is possible without being some form of a swag or uh, let's say if they're a technical engineering team member, I would like to invite them to a conference that I will be attending as well. So we can go as a team. So you can spark a little bit that curiosity a bit more. Uh, that's one thing for sure that you could do. And you could, there are a lot of great offerings on the market that you could just plug and play. I also don't believe in that. I believe it has to be adapted to your organization. 
let's say your organization uses a specific product that we that would be a, like a product management or other type of software you could basically look into the invite or other emails like let's say you have had a task for me and you have invited me to work on that task i could basically replicate that email and send it as a threat actor as a simulation so that it's going to look like the legitimate thing but it's not going to be and and i think this is the way you excel your awareness program like you you make people think it's not just a, a very basic email phishing templates it's like the next step because threat actors are already doing that and their success rate is not that low it's surprisingly high so if you spend that your people will be super vigilant and your organization will be a completely in a different dimension obviously there's no safe organization there is a, a very famous quote uh, by uh, uh, Schneider that says uh, most organizations have been breached they just don't know about it and i tend to believe in that spend spending my mostly my whole professional life in cybersecurity uh they have been breached one way or another uh, it's just about of time a, a, a matter of time finding about it the other thing that i have found work in the office culture is to think about ways that you can inject these kind of ideas about cybersecurity one way is when people like when I used to work uh, at Amazon, one of the ways was um, when people forgot their laptop unlocked, I would go and change their desktop or something to something a bit funny. Right. Uh, actually, the funny funny story here is I used to work to another company before that. And here in Bulgaria, we have this very famous singer. He's called Aziz. Uh, I'm just sharing his name so people can look it up. He's a bit like uh, an interesting figure, let's say. But it's a bit controversial. And we used to put it on desktops all the time here. But when I was working in a larger corporation, I, I wasn't really sure if I'm not going to overstep uh, some HR policy or something. Mm -hmm. yeah. I was thinking to myself, what can I do that it's you know funny but non-existent? So I started putting unicorn. It's not existent. Nobody's going to get upset about it. So a few years after I left, I've read on a LinkedIn post about a thing called unicorning. And I was like, wow, this no thing have, have, have lived after me, which is pretty cool. It, it could have been a zissing, but it's unicorning. <laughs> and we actually, when we were a small team, uh, we actually started first with, if you get caught with like laptop and lock or something like that, you got, you're going to go buy donuts for the team. And that works for a small organizations, for small team, small teams. But after a while, like the team was so large that if you get caught, um, uh, and you have to buy like 20 or 30 or 50 donuts. Mm -hmm. It's just not sustainable. Mm -hmm. So you really have to think about ways that are sustainable, uh, in a way, productive, funny. Uh, nobody's going to get upset about it. There, there's no you know abuse, harassment in, 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 in those uh, funny elements. And at the same time, it's like, it's like a gamification in a way so that everyone mm -hmm. can participate and just to remind us that these little mistakes can cost us a lot. And it's some people may argue like, okay, but I'm in an office environment. Our office has security and access control, cameras, et cetera, et cetera. Why would I care if I'm like 10 meters away from my computer, it's unlocked, and or I'm in the coffee uh, area and I just let my laptop unlocked? Well, it's, it's about building this uh, muscle memory because Tomorrow, when you're in a coffee shop or elsewhere, and if you get your laptop unlocked, and I've, as someone who works in the uh, in in the sector, and obviously I have this professional tendency to see these things all the time, there's so many laptops and devices out in the wild, unlocked and open, and it takes literally like a like a less than a thirty seconds to someone to plug in a rubber ducky, basically a malicious USB device, and take over your laptop for for less than a minute. So it's just about right. introducing people to this realm, but just with this information is enough, like explain to them, maybe like buying a couple of rubber duckies and showing them during their onboarding, hey, this is a malicious device. If you forget your laptop unlocked while you're in, you know, on a coffee shop, this is what it happens. And you plug it in and show them how quickly it is for you to take over their uh, their laptop and their machine. So it just brings this awareness. And, and now they're, also, it, it also improves their personal life. So tomorrow when, you know, they're uh, 
communicating with strangers online, they're less likely to be defrauded online. So it also helps them in their personal life. I find it really interesting that, uh, and, and and it's a great honor to to host this, this show. Um, I speak to lots of different leaders in lots of different spaces, some more operational, some more technical, some more security, et cetera. But I find it interesting how in nearly all of the episodes we've done, and I'm sure it'll be the same moving forward, it always kind of links back to people and engagement, et cetera, because it sounds like what you're saying is there's there's a change policy or there's some sort of transformational change, which is info security and cyber security that, that people need to think about. And naturally, people are very resilient to change and they don't want to change habits, et cetera. And the only way to get them to do it isn't to just get them to do a tick box exercise, but is to kind of embed it into the human behavior so that they do it naturally, muscle memory, everything like you said. And it sounds like the same kind of thing, whether this is thinking about how you design your software architecture or how you think about locking your laptop before you walk away from your desk. Like it's the same kind of challenge and that it lies with the people and getting the people incentivized enough to just do it themselves it could be just because is is part of the the key to all of this so is it is is the answer then whatever interesting fun and engaging way that you can think of to get people engaged into it is what's going to allow people to be more engaged and therefore more likely to do the right things and, and attribute the right behaviors and therefore you're less likely to be breached absolutely and that's true not only for non-technical people, for technical as well. Because let's say that you have spent a great time to train and prepare your people. Now you are going to have ambassadors in every single team. And as we know in, in, in security uh, and in lots of other areas probably, uh, it's way more effective to spend some time in prevention and to identify issues during the early design stages than in later stages. When an organization starts to grow significantly, you need to have um, more or less, as I said, ambassadors or eyes in every single team because a little change may significantly impact your security posture. So the good thing about a, a great security culture is you basically let people uh, be your, first of all, your ears in uh, various decisions. So they can tell you, hey, actually, we were having a design discussion for this feature, but I don't think it was secure enough. Can you have a look at it? Or maybe they're like qualified and capable to look at it and, and propose controls during that meeting. So you don't even need to be present and, and review things. That could be also effective and, and great outcome of a good security culture. Um, yes, it is a it is a problem of engagement, but if you spend a good time and effort into that direction, it would be so effective for your overall security, not your checkbox security. Obviously, this is something very culture is something very difficult to you know um, present and report on and, and quantify, but it's something you spend a, a great effort and I think it yields the most um, value for, for, for your investment in, in from, a, from a leader perspective. Probably that's true for any other leadership role from people management to sales to anything because yeah. people are so important in, in cybersecurity. As I said, like technical teams, because um, we also run a security champions programs within those teams and, and we run it only with people who are interested in the topic. And, and we're so passionate about it and we talk about it and in every little like sub area, we, we have a segregation of areas or most commonly in engineering teams called pizza teams. We have representatives that are looking into these design decisions. And when it comes to a proper security review after a feature is being uh, selected for development, it have already have these security controls integrated because you have already have uh, those like seeds everywhere. So it's less friction, less problems for you as a, as a security team and security uh, professional. And it's, and it's completely different conversation because people now understand why we are doing these things. It's not just because regulation, it's because we would like to make it safely. We are thinking from a perspective of a threat actor, what could go wrong? 
inside and outside, because it's important to consider the inside uh, vectors and, and, and threats and factors as well. And it's a completely different discussion. It's It makes your job way more easier, but it's not an easy problem. Obviously, you have to spend some time thinking about it, how to do it creatively, how to do it in a way that it's engaging. Obviously, you're going to have some people that are, because they've spent time in other organizations and corporations and cybersecurity was neglected or was presented in a bad light. It was more of a top-down, policy-driven decision made. And it was not explained to them, like, why we're doing these things. They don't really enjoy it. Like, they have done these brainless security trainings in the beginning. And they're like, ah, no, not, not again. I have to do that because of mm. something. And, and if they understand what is the root cause, the reason behind it, and, and what could go wrong, like, if you... Because I, I like to spend some time during the onboarding to explain to people how various very large, very successful organizations have been breached because of a single small mistake they've made in either procedure or, or, or technological, or, or maybe just a person clicked on the wrong link and didn't report it. And it, it changed the conversation completely because they now understand I'm actually part of this. It's a, This organization is a living organism. And I am part of the immune system. And when we detect a threat, a virus, it's good for me to report it because this is how I'm protecting the overall organization because this is how we, we stay connected in it. Love that. That's, that's, a, that's a brilliant way of putting it. You mentioned earlier about the community that, that talks about this space being quite closed and and less transparent and and i think of an area that i know far more about for example um software engineering and how many good discussions you see online about good coding principles and the right way to build architecture and how not to create technical debt etc and they they create really good discussion points online and you know verbally when you're conversing with people which i think makes that space better and better because people then start to think about it earlier in the process and and yield better results moving forward so why why do you think that this space in particular is more closed and and what can we do to create more transparency within it do you think and and to be specific my criticism is about the leadership communities not about the practical hands-on like pen testing right. or hacking kind of communities because yeah. they're quite transparent and honest and, and direct and they share a lot of tools and practices and things i don't see the same level of uh communication and, and sharing in in the higher level uh, leadership communities and i'm a member of a few of those and and they're just a bit more dry than any other forum that i've, I've seen to uh i honestly still yet to find out the the reasons I'm, I'm trying to understand why there isn't more sharing of knowledge and insight in those communities because uh what those leaders have to offer it's a lot of insight a lot of um knowledge and and a lot of know-how that could help grow the overall community because there is a, a, a such a huge demand for talent and if we don't spend a, a good enough time to encourage and build it and uh, mentor it, it's not going to appear out of nowhere. It's not going to happen. Also, from time to time, we have a very complex problems to solve that could be either with people or process or technology. And that level of the community is a little bit more secretive. They don't want to share that they have a certain problem, so they don't probably don't want to be judged. Or, or I don't know, they're doing consultancy. They don't want to uh, tamper with that personal image and 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 that uh part of their PR, personal PR. Maybe I, I I'm I'm just guessing. Yeah. But if we compare to the to the rest of uh the InfoSec, the, the rest of the InfoSec communities, and especially the, the more practical ones, the more hands-on ones, they're sharing so much information. But I think leaders need to be a bit more open and and a bit more, as I said, uh help out the new starters in the sector. Highly encouraging anyone who have the ability, and probably most of them don't have the time, the luxury of time, but if they do, to spend some time with like mentoring programs and internship programs to help build the next generation of security professionals. Because obviously there are a lot of people that would like to start their career in InfoSec, but they're afraid of uh, complexity or technology or 
obviously there is a lot of complexity nowadays because of so many things changing, uh, regulations and, and things to look at, but it's not that scary. And if we have enough leaders that are saying and, re and repeating this message, maybe we'll have more starters in the sector and, and more people will be choosing this career path, more diverse people will be choosing this career path. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it feels very much like the barriers to entry. That there might not be a huge amount of barriers to entry, but it feels like there is because there isn't a huge amount of transparency around it. And so people automatically assume that it's very complex and it's very difficult to get into. You know, if if we think about things moving forward then and cybersecurity, infosecurity, security generally ac across this industry has morphed and changed and grown into an absolute beast and and the world is becoming more and more digital and technical etc how how do you keep up with this if you're if you're the person as, as you are who goes right all of info security is on my shoulders and i've got to ensure that as we move forward and as a new tech tool comes through the door every day as generative ai continues to become whatever it's becoming um as we move closer and closer to john connor and terminator how how do we how do you manage that like how do you think about that what are the things that you try to put in place or do you just have to be very agile around it like what's your thoughts on that wow that's an amazing question first of all it's very difficult to keep up with absolutely everything uh because like there's so many moving parts and if you spend a significant amount of time on keeping up, maybe you wouldn't have time to focus on real problems and, 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 and work. But generally speaking, I have a couple of sources that I'm consuming on a regular basis, uh, a couple of like newsletters that are a bit more uh, like in a summary. One of them is TLDRSEC and another one is Risky Biz. They're very, very informative. Also, I have my own personal like selection of it's basically like a social media aggregator that consumes tweets and a lot of things. And usually on the mornings, I have like a like a summary of what have happened. But I just try to have a glance on it. I don't like to spend a significant amount of time into that. Mm. What I like to do also is participate in in active online communities, local and international ones, to understand what's really happening. And and and, and those communities could vary from a bit more high level to even uh, darknet forums. Reason being is if you, if, and the good thing is in, in our sector is you could actually see what the, the bad guys are up to. You, you can join these forums and, and read and, and look into their new tactics and figure out what they're doing real life, like from today. So I think that's something cool and interesting that you could do. And obviously to, be up to date with regulations. You have to spend a little bit of time to read them. Sometimes these publications and documents are quite complicated and, and lengthy. So I like to spend also, I, I like to use generative AI to summarize them sometimes. It's very helpful. Uh, and overall, it's as I said, it's very difficult to stay uh, on, on, on the edge of, of all the technology developments. But if you spend a significant amount of time in understanding the fundamentals in the sector and rereading interesting pieces that you have found before, uh, eventually you are going to have a very good fundamental understanding and, and just, the, just the various mediums would change, it, whether that be cloud or quantum computing or whatever it is. Um, but I do believe that you have to consider some amount, some hours per week for, for yourself to keep yourself up to date. Otherwise, because the sector is more or less evolving at some space, obviously there are other sub areas that are faster in their involvement, uh, you need to consider that this career path, this career choice will be a, a lifelong educational journey. Like you need to continuously learn and, and try new things and, and you know figure it out because all, I, I actually think that's the interesting part because it's evolving, it's constantly changing. It's, you're never going to have a dull moment. It's there's always something new. Unfortunately, there's always something, some some breach to read about and some new tactic to read about. So that's the the fun part. And I also enjoy listening to podcasts like this one 
especially when I'm commuting and driving. It's so enjoyable. Actually, when we're tripping with friends uh, on long uh, destinations, I like to, when when they agree, of course, not everyone enjoys mm-hmm. my uh, podcast selections, but when they agree, I, I like to, you know, pick up uh, uh, a podcast that shares some interesting insights about breaches and fraud. And then they're very interesting from a storytelling perspective. And mm-hmm. it's, for me, it's like a like a audiobook. It's like super interesting to to listen to about a particular situation and, and kind of comprehend it and discuss it with friends and and people that are interested into that. So this is also a vector for you to build awareness uh, about it. Mm. It sounds it sounds very much like you live and breathe it. It's just part of who you are. You know, you consume the content on it because you enjoy it and you find it interesting. And you've got an inquisitive mind. And and that's allowed you to be very successful within the industry and, and hopefully pass that on to others and, and get at least, if you could get everybody to feel 50% of the way you feel about it, then that would be enough to engage people so that those fundamentals, like you say, can be put yeah. in place. Yeah, when, when people see that you're passionate about it and you could use storytelling or other approaches to engage with them, they would at some point spend some time to think about it. And and that's the point. Uh, eventually, they're going to be way more careful and and way helpful when, when you need them to help you with building the security program. Yeah, absolutely. AI, which I just mentioned. So we, we've, we've discussed, you know, the, the world moving at a rapid pace. And I think a lot of what you've said applies to all areas of technology. Like it is, oh, it is constantly evolving uh, and, and why it's so interesting and, and difficult to navigate through. So AI in particular as the most recent thing that is happening, is that different to everything else moving at a rapid pace and, you know, technology constantly changing, or does this sort of sit in isolation as a, wow, you know, AI is actually very much its own thing and is growing at its own rate and is something that we need to be considering separately to, to everything else just because of how it's evolved over the last six to 12 months? I don't think it has to be looked at as a separate thing. It's obviously part of technology. And I think as a leader, professional, you have to be comfortable with growth and, and new things and new trends. Obviously, there is a lot of hype in AI, like, I haven't seen such since the DevOps big data era, which is which is great. It's a very exciting piece of technology. It's phenomenal. I enjoy it every, I use it every single day for various things from writing emails and summarizing things to even writing code. It has to be used as any other technology with caution and with some level of deep understanding, otherwise you're risking it more or less. Um, one thing is, Generative AI, and uh, it, it could be a potential vector of data exposure for organizations. So they have to be careful. They have to be considered in their usage. Also, what I've seen throughout the past uh, more or less half a year of uh, generative AI usage for myself and my team is uh, it's not always right. You have to augment it. Like That's why you are there. So you don't have to completely rely on any piece of technology. You need to spend some time uh, into effectively integrating it with the rest of your system and, and, all, and also considering how it could be abused. Like what are the vectors? What are the ways that this could turn wrong? And one of the problems that I've seen is sometimes obviously it hallucinates and it generates things that are incorrect. And that could be dangerous for our sector, for cybersecurity. Let's say if you're building like a policy that is uh, for some form of a access control or a firewall. There are so many times that I've seen it hallucinating with things that are not existing. And it's uh, so confident in, the, in its response that you, if you're unexperienced, you might truly believe it. And if you use the whatever it generated, like let's say policies or uh, automation or something, and you haven't tested it thoroughly from end to end and ensure that it really works, you might end up implementing things that are non-effective and uh, actually exposing or potentially risking it with, with your organization. So you have to be using it, but with caution. It's a great time saver, and I highly recommend it. Like, I, I don't see a future without it. Uh, obviously, I, I love the 
models and, and, and the prompts that are available to us publicly. But we as an organization try to limit their usage in a way or at least monitor it so that we can protect our data and our organization. We have trained our people. We've spent a significant amount of time to, to do that because it's here to stay. People are already using it. Like everybody that I know in the technical sector is using it. And it's, it's amazing. It's so exciting. But at the same time, you have to use it with a little bit of caution and uh, ability to understand what it does, how it does it, and verify its answers because it could be uh, damaging, it could be dangerous. But overall, uh, it's really, we are headed to a very, very exciting and interesting future. Um, obviously, uh, I also recommend that to other professionals. It could be used for, for threat actors, for, for bad things. Uh, there was various uh, news recently about uh, prompts that are being used to generate very uh, proficient phishing emails looking like, you know, in the past, people would tell you, especially in these trainings that you mentioned, oh, look for grammar mistakes in the email. That might be an indicator that's phishing. That's not a real reality since maybe five years, mm -hmm. especially nowadays with ChatGPT. It could plug in into a, a past email communication and inject phishing uh, with a lot of context into the conversation. So it could be used for very dangerous things, and we have to be aware about that as well. Uh, but it could be used for amazing, uh, amazing and productive things. Like we, as I, as I mentioned, my team is using it on a daily basis. I encourage the usage because I can see people with less technical experience are using it to uh, for software development, for security automation. And I really enjoy that. Like I'm super supportive about it because I see how much uh, pro productivity increase and and uh, how much time management improvement can can bring to your life. It could be used on so many areas and sectors. Uh, I'm always up for exploring new ways to improve the team and personal productivity. Mm -hmm. In in your opinion, and you alluded to it just then about the the truth that sits within it sometimes isn't isn't quite the truth or is incorrect because it's amalgamating data from different areas. I remember many, many moons ago being in history class in school and a huge piece of history at the time was differentiating between different sources of information and trying to figure out which source of information was the truth. Uh, and I, like, I remember thinking being a kid, this is useless. I'm never going to, this is never going to mean anything to me. I don't really care about history. And then you, you fast forward in today's current age that is so important across everything isn't it social media yeah. the algorithms that pump us the information that it knows that we want to see which self-fulfills and creates echo chambers and it's really hard to differentiate the truth now from just information which is sometimes just slightly incorrect but compounds and compounds into something that is largely incorrect how, how do we get around that that's going to be a very big challenge for the for the next few years, generations, because AI has become so creative. You've probably seen these AI detection engines online. Yeah. You could basically generate something with an AI and then paste it back and ask, hey, can you make it a bit more, you know, fluid in a way that cannot be detected and go back to the AI detection engine and it cannot be detected. Like there is there is that, and it looks scary because obviously AI is made by us humans and it has been made by information collected online, scraped from various sources. So it is in a way or shape form, it's biased. So it's, as you mentioned, compounded in, in its model one way or another. So I think in the future it will be very difficult for us to distinguish what is the source and what is the truth. In, in 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 all the data sources and information that we read online and that's going to be very valuable if we can find sources that are trustworthy and, and we believe in them whether it be you know informational sources uh any sort of news outlets etc i think that would be very valuable in the future because it is like the 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 truth of sources is, is threatened in today's world my final question, and I've purposely avoided a lot of talking about Payhaw because you and I have, have talked about your, your 
for, for everybody to be really clear, you're you're not the PR for Payhawk or anything. You're you're doing this as as McGlenn, who works for a great organization. But if we could touch on the idea of Payhawk being a very successful organization, what what do you think has made Payhawk successful, in your opinion, from a from a top level, top down view perspective? I'd say a couple of things. Obviously, the leadership team. The, the co-founders, Christo, Boyko, and Constantine, they're really thoughtful leaders, quite wise. Like they're very ahead of the uh ahead of the curve. They're always looking into things to optimize and they're working very effectively. I think that's the core reason why it is so uh successful. Mm. But apart from that, and not only apart from actually it's the people, the rest of the of of the people that have been hired in the organization. I don't think there have been any com- compromises with the hiring process, and I think that's important for organization at this scale to have a very efficient and effective hiring and onboarding process. Otherwise, you're risking to make bad, bad hiring decisions, and then to spend great time and effort to train your people. That's really important. You would like them to excel. If we exclude that, obviously, nowadays we have an amazing technology that we could leverage, and the engineering team is quite uh, efficient into that. Uh, I, With pride, I could say even my team is quite efficient into leveraging various technology to do their job efficiently and effectively, and we're constantly looking into ways to optimize things. And if we exclude that as well, in, in game theory, there is this sub part that if you have two teams and one of them is uh, is working to a definite um, target, let's say achieving a certain goal, and another one has a set of values that is working towards, uh, the latter will always be more successful. And even Payhawk is fairly uh, small to mid-sized startup. It has already ingrained values that people are following and understanding and they're well explained internally. And I think that's the that's the fiber of the company. And most of the people are like super excited to be, including myself, to be working in such an organization. And I think that's the contributing factors for the for the success. And obviously the demand for this kind of service and the quality work that people are doing. But that's uh, that's uh, things that are following up the previous reasons, probably. Yeah, that's amazing. It, once again, it comes back to pe- it comes back to people. Which, uh, which, it, which, which it always seems to. It took me a while to realize that because I was a completely focused on technology through most of my career. I thought technology is, obviously, it is amazing, but I thought it's the number one thing, priority that people should be focused on. And that was, you know, me early in my Dunning-Kruger journey throughout the scale of uh, misunderstanding how things are working in the organization and throughout Obviously, my maturing process as a, a professional and nowadays as a leader, I, I understood like uh, it's not technology because technology is just a, a piece of the puzzle of the picture. But if you don't have a great people that are using it and understanding it, you are not going to be a successful organization or or anything or business. Yeah, very wise words. Thank you, McGlenn. It's been an absolute pleasure talking to you today. Loads of uh, insightful things that I think. I myself will go and digest and and learn from and hopefully others. Once again, like I said at the start of the podcast, um, if people have enjoyed this episode, if they've made it this far with us and, and been on this journey and this conversation, we'd love you to check out some of the other episodes. Check out Spotify, Apple, Leadership Unplugged, or the London page. Feel free to reach out to myself or McGlenn, LinkedIn, email, whatever it might be, just on trying and hack us based off of this conversation that we've just had. <laughs> But we would love to continue this conversation and see what people think about it and how engaged they are, whether there is this idea that security is this old and dusty and dry area that people think about, don't they? And and how we can move away from that to try and create something that's more engaging and get you people engaged and realize that it's still a people problem like so many other things within technology. So please reach out, talk to us, like, subscribe, all the usual things. Um, And if you've enjoyed this, check out the other episodes as well. McGlenn, thank you very much. I will speak to you soon, my friend. Thanks for having me. Highly appreciate it. Cheers, McGlenn. Bye for now.